Welcome to Basic Brewing Radio for Thursday, April 4th, 2024. I'm James Spencer. Here at Basic Brewing Radio, we're all about home brewing. This week, Matt Giovanisi of Brew Cabin continues his quest to brew the perfect hazy IPA. In his latest experiment to dial in towards perfection, he plays with Whirlpool hops. Will his tweaks make the beer better? We'll stick around and find out. If you want to support us financially, check out patreon.com slash basic brewing. And many thanks to everybody who was helping out in that way. If you go to patreon.com slash basic brewing, you can see a long list of stuff that you can access if you sign up as a supporter. And many thanks to the new Patreon subscribers who are signing up to help us move this little choo-choo down the tracks. And uh, I, what I've done is I've cleaned up the the uh, Patreon site a little bit. I've uh, deleted like the, the old uh, early release posts uh, because, you know, once once it's out there, it's not, you know, the early release posts aren't, aren't too useful anymore. So uh, whenever I put up a new early release, I'm going to take down the previous early release. So you'll have the recipes, you'll have the uh, behind the scenes videos, you have the bonus videos, you know, you have all that stuff out there. Uh, hopefully easier to find. Uh, financial supporters will see an early release this Friday of an oat stout battle between Steve Wilkes and me. Not not really a battle. <laughs> um, in this video episode, Steve and I compare my oat malt stout with his oat stout brewed with a little maltodextrin and brown sugar. Mm. Along with the early release, subscribers will get a bonus video of how my beer came together and the recipes for both beers. Along with the stout video, this week Steve and I shot a video tasting my Belgian single that uh, we both loved, spoiler, uh, and I wouldn't mind making more of. And we also tasted my hoppy raw ale, uh, that Chris Colby and I will formulate on next week's audio show. So sort of a time warp happening here, <laughs> the way the way I've got my shows lined up. Um, I, uh, I fermented that raw ale um, with the seasonal yeast from our friends at Imperial Yeast, A37 Pog. Pog is Ebbegarden Kvike. Uh, I pitched it at 90 degrees Fahrenheit or 32C, which still sounds crazy to me. Uh, and it was working the airlock just a couple of hours after I pitched it. I get some lemony flavor and aroma that doesn't usually come from the uh, the hop that I use. So I, I guess I'm going to credit Pog for that. It's a, it's a fun beer. Uh, I fermented inside in the guest bathroom. So it didn't stay at 90 degrees Fahrenheit for that long. Uh, Imperial says when fermented at the upper end of the temperature range, Pog produces an extreme amount of tropical fruit aromas, including pineapple and guava. Now, I've got some more Pog, and I want to save it for when the porch heats up a bit so I can ferment outside. Um, you know, my stir plate is dusty because I don't use it anymore to make starters for moderate gravity five-gallon batches. And my airlocks are usually bubbling before bedtime thanks to those 200 billion cells in each easy-to-open package. Ask your local homebrew store about A37 Pog and check out all the dependable deliciousness at imperialyeast.com. That's imperialyeast.com. We're all ready for the eclipse, I hope. Are you? Are you Are you, Are you? all excited about the eclipse on Monday? Uh, I'm crossing my fingers and all my toes that the weather cooperates on Monday. We've been planning this for a very long time. And we, we picked where we're staying, you know, it's going to, it's April, it's early April, it's going to be a crapshoot, whether whether it's going to be cloudy or not, wherever you are in the country. Um, but since we saw the total eclipse in Missouri in 2017, one of my main life goals was to see another one. And since there's one just, you know, kind of in the neighborhood here, uh, I, I'm really excited about it. We've got big plans to hang out with friends over the weekend, so even if it's cloudy, uh, we'll be having fun and pro maybe drinking some beers and playing some games and stuff like that. So, uh, And if we miss this one, there'll be another one in 21 years, and apparently it'll pass right over here. <laughs> so we won't have to leave the house, which is good because I'll be really old. <laughs> I'll just lean out, the, lean out the window at the nursing home and uh, see the eclipse. So uh, I got to start eating my Wheaties and my Wheaties and making sure that I'm ready in 21 years. Anyway, uh, Matt Giovanisi of Brew Cabin is on a quest, a delicious quest, 
a quest to design the perfect example of one of his favorite styles of beer. This time, Matt focused on hops in the whirlpool. Matt Givanisi, welcome back to Basic Brewing Radio. Thanks for having me back. I'm, my my sinuses are clear this time. I, mm. I, can't, I can't complain about maladies. <laughs> and I have no excuse for, you know, not uh, being able to uh, smell the aromas of these delicious hoppy beers, uh, other than my age. <laughs> mm. Uh, but you you initiated this uh, this uh, conversation again by sending me free delicious beers. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> you sent me three beers, and uh, I immediately opened. Well, I refrigerated, but then immediately opened one, and then uh, grilled some chicken while I was mm-hmm. drinking it, and then afterwards discovered that it was a two of one and one of the other situation. L- yes. Luckily, I drank one of the duplicates just by there you go, <laughs> just by pure luck. Because <laughs> there, one of them's got a mark on the on the bottom, right, uh, and the the other not. But uh, you know that that one that I had uh, um, by the by the by the barbecue grill was 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 delicious. Now now remind us of of what beer this is and what process that you're going through. So we we talked about this on. Another episode, I think, where we were discussing canning. Right. So this is my uh, high fiving a million angels New England IPA hazy IPA recipe, uh, which is basically if you I mean if you boil it down to the the you know just using percentages, it's about eighty percent two row, twenty percent flaked wheats. I know this math's not going to work out. Oh wait, seventy five percent two row, uh, twenty percent flaked oats. And then about 5% carapils. Mm-hmm. That's that's it for the grist. Um, and then for the hops, in in all of these batches, it's a even split between citra and mosaic. And the and I sent you two different versions um, that are the same. I should say they're the same recipe, but one has substantially more hops added to it. And I decided to see what it was like to add more hops into the whirlpool. So the first can that I sent you that's unmarked is the recipe for the hopping recipe is a little bit, I think it's like a half ounce of Magnum at 60 minutes just to give it that base IBU. Um, And then I added two ounces or one ounce each of Citra and Mosaic at flame out and then let it steep for 20 minutes in the whirlpool. And then Dry hop, I dry hop with eight ounces of sp- a split between citra and mosaic, and I do that two consecutive days in a row. Um, so that's this first beer. The second beer, the only difference is that I add it four more ounces into the whirlpool. So instead of two ounces, one of mosaic, one of citra, I add it three of citra, three of mosaic in the whirlpool for 20 minutes. So we, almost the exact same process after that. Um, the only other key difference of the second beer is that it was fermented in a pressure fermenter, not that I used any pressure, but when I went to dry hop it, I just added a little bit of head pressure to push the hops down in a suspension or, or, or put, yeah, push them into the beer a little bit more. So I think the second beer, it has more hops but I think it also has more hop contact. Mm. So it, it, it just looking at the appearance, mm-hmm. they're both hazy, obviously. Yep. Uh, but the, the second one does look more chunky to me. A tad hazy, <laughs> yes. <laughs> and I think holding them both side by side, years ago when I talked to uh, uh, Ray Daniels about hops – he said mm-hmm. that hops actually add a color yeah. to the beer. They had it. They add a reddish tint. Yeah, uh, and I can see that with this beer. I think that even if you hadn't told me, uh, the uh, the one with more hops is is you know, like I say, a bit more hazy. Mm-hmm. Um, and I I I'm talking myself into. Uh, thinking that it it has a slightly redder 
you know, it's not like a red ale, but no, side right. by side with the other, uh, if you were looking at, say, you know, paint s- chips or swatches at a, yep. you know, they would be different. At a yeah. paint store, uh, this one has a, a teeny bit more red. Yeah, I am. Um, I'm curious just from just you. Are, have you opened both or you just have one right now? I've got them both open. Yeah. I'm curious. I know this is like a bad question, but like, which one do you like better? Hmm. Because I have a very strong opinion and I am not it when I I've fed these to a few friends and it seems to be split. The second one. Yeah, I think is a little more bitter. Yep. It's a little sharper. It's more if you close your eyes, it's more kind of West Coasty uh-huh. in the character, uh, whereas the first one is just a nice, juicy, you know, New England IPA. Uh, you know, it's got the, the citrus, you know, the grapefruit stuff. It's got a little bit of the tropical fruit stuff. Mm-hmm. The um, the bitterness is there, uh, but it's not pronounced. Correct. Yeah, I agree. And I think the first beer is because it doesn't have that bitterness. It feels and it's it's not actually true, but it feels sweeter. Mm hmm. Um, even though they finish at the same gravity, which is a uh, 1018. So they both have the same level of sweetness in them. But I think one, the, the second one is a little bit more masked with the, you know, the, the crazy amount of hops. And I think a lot of that bitterness is coming from that. I, I mean, obviously I added more hops during the whirlpool. Uh, but obviously I think the heat and the isomerization or whatever you get from those late edition hops um, certainly added that bitterness. Whereas mm-hmm. I don't know if I would have necessarily gotten that had it been like more dry hops. I mean, mm-hmm. I know it does contribute some bitterness, but I have to imagine the heat and the addition and the extra addition would have been a lot more substantial. Yeah, you know, what's the what's the temperature of the wort during the whirlpool? So I so I used to kind of go I go back and forth on this a lot, uh, just from an, a process like an ease of process, I don't drop the temperature because I use a, uh, like my system's kind of like set and I can't do, I mean, I can do, um, like I can switch things out and move hoses and stuff. But I, what I like to do is just cut the heat, add the hops and then start spinning it, start whirlpooling it with a pump. It, it starts, and here's the thing, I'm at altitude, so my boiling temperature is around 203 degrees. Mm. So it so as soon as I cut the, the heat and I add what's normally cold hops, because um, I keep them in a chest freezer, it drops to around like 201, 200 degrees. And then as I spin it, I keep the lid off, and, it, and by the time, after 20 minutes, it gets down to about 180. And so I like to do it that way as opposed to like dropping the temp, you know, to 180 and then starting there and then just holding the temp at 180 just because for me it's a little bit just – it's easier to do. And I haven't seen – I kind of – so the other thing for me too is that I kind of like the bitterness in these beers. I I know a lot of them like tend to lean on the sweet side and that's – I don't have really – I don't have a sweet tooth for that. Um, So I kind of like it tasting – more like a traditional, I guess, or West Coast IPA with that intense bitterness as opposed to being more sweet because, you know, I dry hopped cold or dry or or whirlpooled a little bit cooler. Now, is the first beer, is this from that batch that you sent me, you know, in the canning discussion? No. So this one is, this is a second, this is the second attempt at that. Hmm. So the first one that I sent you, which I don't know if we discussed this on the show. I probably did. But when I went to dry hop, so that one is the exact same recipe. Uh, the only difference is process. In the um, – when I, when I sent you the first beer, I used a hop dropper, which is this you know little device that goes on top of the machine – or the machine, the fermenter. <laughs> and it's got, I got a butterfly valve on top of the fermenter, so I shut – the fermenter from the top and then I add this, you know, unit to the top of it. It's basically just a tube. It's a, it's a three inch uh, tri clamp tube. And then I have a thing that goes on top of it where I can add the hops 
purge it with CO2 completely, and then I lift, you know, I turn the butterfly valve and it drops the hops straight into the fermenter. So that way, you know, no oxygen gets in during dry hopping. Mm. That said, uh, so I did that twice. I did that two days in a row. So the first day I added four ounces, second day I added another four ounces, and I do a, a dump, a uh, hop dump in between each one. Um, so that it just doesn't pile up and get clogged. Now, in the fermenter that I was using for the last batch, it was I, I have an older conical fermenter from SS Brewtech that has a tight chilling coil inside. And when I went to go clean the unit after canning it and sending it to you, all of the hops got stuck in the in between those coils, and they were dry. Hmm. So. It so the first beer just it it got the same rate the same dry hopping rate except it I di- just wasn't fully soaked in to the beer because it got stuck. Huh. So this beer that you're drinking, the one that's unmarked, is the second version of that. But what I did was I I didn't use the hot dropper I, dropper. I just took the lid off and added the hops around that thing the the coil the chilling coil. Mm. And then when I added the lid back on, I purged the headspace with CO2. Hmm. And I did that two days in a row. So technically, the this beer has more like dry hop contact than the other beer did, which again, I don't I didn't feel there was much of a difference between those two beers. And I know it's been a minute, but I didn't I didn't really perceive a difference. So it, I think there may have been more aroma, but I didn't get more bitterness. It's it was interesting the other day when when I had this beer, you know, by the, you know, by the barbecue grill. Mm-hmm. I was thinking, and it and I can't remember if I had had like an American IPA before I had this one. <laughs> you know, yeah. so my palate was probably Correct. not fresh. Yeah, uh, but I was thinking that this beer was a little softer than the first one is that a is that an incorrect as you know you you're able to taste them you know more closer together and to compare yeah. them is that just my taste buds were off you know uh, off calibrated that day no i would i would say that if anything contributed to that happening it may have been that there was more hop oils in the batch you just had because there was more dry hop contact time. And I found that the more dry hops you get this, like, you know, you get that, that oil extraction, which does lead to mouthfeel or at least lends to that mouthfeel. Mm. Um, so I, but, but as far as recipe, it's the same exact water profile. So I, I start with RO for every batch that I do, and I build that water profile the same way every time. So it wasn't water chemistry. I used the exact same ingredients from the same bags. So it wasn't a difference in ingredients at all. They're the same ingredients. So the grist wouldn't have made a difference. The only thing I think that would have made a difference would have been final gravity, which, again, I didn't. If anything, it might have dropped a point lower because this was a reuse of the first yeast. So the first yeast, I made a starter and – oh, wait. That's not – is that actually true? Yeah, yeah. I made a starter. No, I used fresh – I used a fresh pitch for each. So, no, I wouldn't have been that either. I thought maybe you know if I had a more viable yeast in the second round or a less viable yeast that it would have been – it would have finished a little bit sweeter. But we're talking about like a – uh, maybe one gravity point, if the, if any. So I would say that that wouldn't have any sort of, uh, you wouldn't notice that. And but yeah, the, you know, and then there's the hops, it, the dry hops, and and there's not a probably as a significant difference in the amount of hops to you know cause a dramatic shift from hop creep. You know, in other words, you know, hop creep is when uh, you know you add a bunch of dry hops in the fermenter, and then there are enzymes actually in the hops that convert the the sugars that haven't been fermented yet into more fermentable sugars. And then, you know, mm-hmm. you actually see a drop in gravity, but it does, I mean, I don't have enough experience maybe to, to hazard a guess, but, but it doesn't sound like that that would be a factor with just the difference in the, in that process. So I would say that 
probably not. I do account for dry for uh, hop creep. So I, I, dr- I fermented this beer at 68 degrees. I did a diacetyl rest to 70 degrees. I just bumped it up a couple degree points. Whether I needed to do that or not, I don't know. Um, and then I dropped the temperature to 58 degrees. And then I dry hop. Uh. And I do that uh, because of Scott Janish's book where I want to avoid hop creep. So, you know, kind of dropping the yeast out of suspension. I also dump the yeast so that I could uh, harvest and reuse it for the next batch. And then, yeah, I add uh, the dry hops essentially cold, I guess, or at least below 60 in order to fight that, mm. that, that uh, hop creep effect. Now, I'm tasting the second one, mm-hmm. and it definitely has, as the beers warm up, it definitely has a more... And, you know, I don't know if I'm using the the adjective correctly, but but in my mind, kind of a more dank, uh, yeah. you know, uh, not harsh, but sharper, yep. sharper bitterness. And, you know, when we do the, the hop sampler, mm-hmm. uh, you know, the process, I basically make a wort with extract and bring it just up to the boil. And as it starts bubbling... And around here, you know, our boiling point is around 209, 210. Mm -hmm. Uh, You know, just as it comes up to that, I shut off the heat, then add hops and, and, you know, take it off the heat, let that steep for 10 minutes, and then do a quick chill. You know, because we're only talking about three quarts or about three liters here. Right. Um, But, you know, we're able to get enough bitterness to make a delicious hoppy beer just mm-hmm. using that 10 minutes of you know of that hop stand or of that essentially it's it's a whirlpool you know right right it's essentially what you're doing with a whirlpool yep now i can't remember at one point when i first started the process i took i did take temperature to see how much that had fallen you know in that kettle on the stove with no heat in 10 minutes but mm-hmm. i can't imagine that it that it falls that much. <laughs> right. But um, but we are able to, especially with higher alpha acid hops, like if I say I, you know, put a full ounce of, you know, say a, like a 9% alpha acid hop in there, mm-hmm. you're going to get a substantial bitterness, you know, just from that 10-minute uh, hop stand. Yeah. You know, at basically below boiling temperature. Yep. So Yeah. And it, yeah, and it comes through. I mean, it's it there. There's a clear difference between these two beers, and as far as bitterness is concerned. Now I, I could, you know, the, you say that it's split. Um, I could see where that where it could be divis- d- divisive because, yeah. you know, some people just don't like bitter beer, right? Uh, they but, like sweet beer, right? But I, I kind of, I kind of like, I kind of like an edge. You know, I to, do. It makes so it I more, makes it more you. drinkable to me. Yeah, I agree with you that I like the more bitter version. Uh, and yeah, I had a friend that I also mailed it to, and he was just like, "Yeah, I don't." He's like, "It's not for me. Uh, it's too oh. hoppy." But my wife loves it, you know. Oh. She 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 drinks <laughs> the hazy style. So like, yeah. And I was like, oh, "Okay, which one did you pick?" She he's like, "I had a two on the bottom." I'm like, all right, well that's the more hoppier one. So why don't you try the other one? <laughs> You know, so I, yeah, I prefer the one with more, and I won't call it, I don't know if it's, it's, I've heard a friend of mine call it hot burn. I don't think it's that, I, cause that, that feels very different to me. It, that almost, that almost hurts a little bit. Mm. This just feels like it's, it's just bitter. There's just a, I mean, you, if you pushed it a little more, it could be hot burn. I mm-hmm, think, mm-hmm. I think, I think it's. It's not there, but uh, like for me, but uh, but I think yeah, I think I think if, it, if you're right on the right on the edge, uh, right on the balance, <laughs> I agree, I agree, <laughs> yeah, and and you know I cold crash both of these beers, so I mean, literally the process was exactly the same in brewing these uh, to the to the day. the The only difference being that this beer literally just has four more ounces of hops in the whirlpool than the other beer. And we, um, we should say this is a like around a five gallon or 19 liter batch size. <laughs> yeah. Oh, well that's what I designed it for, but that's not what I got. <laughs> when you add, when you start adding that many hops, oh. <laughs> you get like half a keg. <laughs> I probably got three gallons, maybe, maybe three and a half gallons on each of these. 
Cause I, cause what I like to do is when I dry hop, I will, you know, when I, so I, I guess I double dry hop. I didn't, I don't double the amount. I just double the, I just stagger the addition and I like to dump whatever's at the bottom and then kind of add a fresh batch on top. Mm. And then, you know, I keep dumping until it cleared out because then that I get a, I get a nice clean transfer to the keg. If I do that, plus with, uh, cold crashing, it helps a lot. And I noticed that, you know, it's cause I, I put both of these beers. So both of these beers were added to a keg, uh, I didn't condition them. I literally just added CO2 for a week at 15 PSI. So where I'm at, we have to add an additional, I think it's an additional half PSI for every thousand feet Mm. you go up. Mm. So if you look at a, um, you know, a a carbonation chart and I wanted to get maybe 2.4, I, it's, 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 you know, it's hot. It's the carbonation is like a little bit lower than it probably should be 2.4, maybe 2.2, uh, which I think for me is like 12 PSI would be 12 PSI normally, but I have to jack, uh, jack it up to 15 PSI because of my altitude. Huh? At that's least that's it, what that's, I was told. That's interesting because, you know, if you seal a keg, uh-huh. the, the beer doesn't know what, you know, what the right. outside, I, outside PSIs are, <laughs> you know, it's not, yeah, for, whether read... it's 14, what is it? 14.7 pounds per square inch, nor, normal uh, atmospheric pressure at sea level or whatever. So that's interesting. You, so you say that, and that to me, that like I told my friend, I'm like, yeah, we have to cook food hotter up here. Well, that you makes know, so sense. I, that makes sense. So, Cause, right, it, cause but, that's open. Right. But then he, he's like, but your, if your oven is sealed and it knows the temperature, then how is that different? Well, but but that's different too, <laughs> right? So, so I I just you know I I kept thinking like oh you know because it started with should I be concerned about this and then I saw a post from I don't know some high altitude brewing I think it was like high altitude brewing or something and it said add zero point five psi when you're carbonating your beer for every thousand feet so for me that's two point five huh at five thousand interesting and and. I've I've been told that my beers, you know, I don't think these beers are over carbonated, but I've had friends say that oh they're over carbonated, but that's because they used to keep them at twenty, so now they're down to fifteen and they seem to be like kind of right where I want them to be. So I I think I could go lower, but I've had things that I've carbonated at ten to twelve psi and I or even twelve psi and I'm like no oh, this kind of feels flat to me. Now, but maybe I just like a more sparkly. Now here, now here's here's an interesting question, at least to me, because I'm making it and I've had a few sips of beer. But say say you're you know you're up there in the Rocky Mountains mm-hmm. and you send me a beer and I'm here in the Ozark Mountains. Mm-hmm. Is my beer going to be more carbonated when I open it up and pour it? Like for instance, if you get in an airplane and you drink your water bottle mm-hmm. and your empty water bottle and you close it up when you're at altitude. When you get down on the ground, it looks crushed a bit, you know, because well, the all, you, you know the yeah, atmospheric so. pressure on the you know on the ground, yeah, uh, as opposed to what the whatever pressure they have in the in the airplane is higher, and so yeah, you know, and, and there's another question: do they do they uh, do they sell specially pressurized uh, soft drinks to the airline industry? Because it seems like to me that if you know, if you were to open a, a carbonated beverage at altitude where mm-hmm. the the air the pressure is lower, it seems like it would fizz all up and foam all up. Interesting, yeah. Because where I live, all of our potato chip bags are inflated like balloons; like you could <laughs> pop them. <laughs> yeah, sure. Right. So I don't know. That's uh, a good question. Somebody knows that. Somebody knows that. And perhaps I am doing something that I don't really need to do. Hmm. Well, I mean, you're, I, I would mean, love to know. I mean, you, you know, you've got to do your process to, as far as, you know, what you're, what works for you. Yeah. Uh, but, but, you know, these beers weren't, you know, overly foamy when I, no. when I opened them, you know. No. Uh, so eh, maybe it's not that, maybe it's not that much of a difference, but, you know. Does Coors do they have you know if they ship yeah, well, beer if they great, ship yeah. beer to you right. know New Orleans yeah do they have different beer for different <laughs> altitudes that they ship I doubt it 
<laughs> I don't know. But that would be fascinating. That, that, was, that was a tangent, but I think a fun one, and maybe yeah. a, maybe a useful yeah. one. Somebody will yeah. somebody will somebody will write in some information about that. <laughs> I mean, so it's it's. I would love to know because even in the software that I use, I do have to put in my altitude for specifically hot bitterness mm. because I'm not boiling at two twelve. I'm boiling at two o three. Right. So I don't get the same isomerization, I guess, as somebody at sea level. Right. So for me, it's like it. I need more hops to get IBUs. Right, right. That, that makes sense. Yeah. But then, but then, when you get to the uh, the whirlpool uh, stage of things, it seems like things would kind of even out. Yeah, you would think. Because then you're not. I mean, unless you're, you know, actually boiling under pressure, you know, and but unless you're, yeah. <laughs> I mean, the reason pressure cookers are useful is that, you know, you can get the boiling point of water higher, well, right, under higher pressure, right. Um, you know, that's the inverse of what you're going through, and I know that there there are certain like when you know when they cook in the Andes uh, mountains, uh, mm-hmm. you know, pressure cookers are. That's how you cook a lot of stuff. Yeah, because you got to. Um, yeah, and I'm I I doubt it makes any difference in the dry hop. Oh no, or just just being not. up here. No, now. I wouldn't think so. Does this does this feedback that you're getting on this stage of the process? You know, you mm-hmm. said that you were gonna, you know, take this tr- through several different uh, steps and several yeah. different experiments to kind of dial in this this recipe. Yes. How does this feedback affect the next round? So the feedback is tough because I – what I've been getting is – there's I guess the feedback that I want is somebody to go, holy crap, this is the best beer I've ever had. And then I'm like, oh, my job's done. <laughs> Right. Uh, I'll never get that feedback unless, you know, I magically make something one day. And and I don't really have a lot of people in my personal life who are beer. You know, they, they evaluate beer. So they're really just, you know, casual drinkers. And so I've had to do this myself. So I've taken this both of these beers and I've and I've I've been buying beers from all over the country. To like the like as best as I can find, and stacking them up against this to see what they're doing versus what I'm doing, and then you know trying to do some research to see um, some of the beers that I've been stacking them up against is like Treehouse and Fidens, and there's another one from New York. I I'm blanking on the name. There's a brewery here in Colorado called Outer Range. There's another one which I think it's the closest to at this point, but. I think that there's some there's a couple of changes that I'd like to make. And again, I'm trying to decide on which one to do first because I don't want to do all of them, you know, and then have something that I'm like, oh, I don't know which which Mm. variable made this happen. Yeah. But one of the things I'd like to do and I saw. uh, So I even drank uh, a beer that Josh made, which I. Oh, yeah. Josh Secor from Gambit. Yeah. I'm trying to think. I think I'm blanking on the name of that specific beer that he made. But he had on the can. It, he said he used wheat, and I've and I've heard uh, people from Treehouse say that they use they don't use as much flaked oats. So one of the things I'd like to try is to either add flaked oats or sorry, add wheat to the beer, or and either replace it with flaked oats or add it in on top of flaked oats. And so I, and I know you you were very complimentary of that uh, gambit beer. Josh's yeah, it was beer. really really good. Yeah, and I also measured well, the other thing I did too was when I put all these beers side by side, I measured their pH. Mm. And I was my these beers are around four point four. I think one I forget which one. One of them's four point four. The other one's four point five. Every other beer was in the like four point five to up to four point eight range. But I started adding little drops of lactic acid into my, into my glass mm. for my beer. And I, it completely changed the flavor and I loved it. I, I thought it was way better, huh. but it just tasted more juicy. Like it just had a juicier flavor and better shelf life. So, and that you, you would think that that would accentuate the citrus. Yeah. 
So that's that's how I enter, and I'm like, ooh, I really like a lower pH, but that's not common in that style. A lot of them kind of hover around 4.5 final pH. And hmm. I dropped my, I dropped one of them down to 3.8 and I was like, this is delicious, but it's also now sour, <laughs> <laughs> you know? Well, I could see what this, like the first beer that, that I tasted, I could see where a little more acidity would, would help bring, bring out the hop character. Yeah. I, I would like to try that as well as, is do a, um, a post fermentation, uh, pH adjustment and see where that gets me. Uh, I would like to, so one of the biggest issues I'm having in the process of making this beer is that I don't really end up with a lot of beer at the end because of the, you know, we're talking five gallons and an insane amount of dry hopping Mm -hmm. and and not only dry hopping, but adding six ounces in the kettle, you know, I'm, I'm not getting a lot of that's being absorbed as well. Right. So, I would like to experiment with at least in just the dry hop doing a hundred percent uh cryo or or incognito or whatever you know hop you know the light hop version mm-hmm. so that way I could at least cut that in half and still get the same amount of aroma out of it, but more beer in the keg yeah that'd be that'd be fun that'd but be I a, don't a fun fun it, comparison. Yeah, and I don't my my worry though is and I, this is this should not be a worry, but I and I understand that <laughs> not everyone cares about this as probably as much as I do, but the haze level is important to me because uh whenever I see or when I know that people judge that when they go to drink it, the more haze, the more it looks and probably they perceive it as more juicy. And so these beers were I've I've seen hazier beers that I've compared it to. Hmm. And there's a couple of ways I think I could get that haze level. And I've been – I had these – I was showing you earlier. I had these little puck lights um, because my brewery <laughs> is all these really warm lights that I have. And I've tried to switch them to like a cooler light, but then it's really sterile in here and it doesn't feel very good to hang out in. But – the the reason I bought these puck lights that are are daylight temperature color temperature is because I want to see I want to be able to compare haze and color between beers, which is a little overkill I understand but I I'm I'm curious in what causes that sort of milky look, whereas these beers don't have that milky look they huh. have a they're they're cl- I mean they're not like they're def- incredi- they're definitely hazy <laughs> they're definitely hazy yeah yeah. yeah. And, but and, they're not, yeah. and they're not clear, but they're not like, I don't know. It looked like, uh, I'm trying to think of like what would be the equivalent in like orange juice. Is orange juice is basically you can't see through it. Right. You know, well, and, well follow, follow, uh, um, Sapwood Sellers on Instagram and a yeah. lot of, <laughs> yeah, that's exactly that. And there's a brewery <laughs> where I used to live in Jersey, uh, called Troon. And whenever I see their beers on Instagram, I'm like, and I just like yellow milk. It's crazy. <laughs> and there's a couple of ways. And so like, yeah, there are, there are ways that I could cheat and get that. Like I could add, I mean, cheat is not the right word, but I could add lactose to my beers, which would make them sweeter, which could give it that, you know, hazy ability or hazy quality. Perhaps. I don't know that. I don't, that's just a theory of mine. Uh, another one I've heard some people talk about on pot, on other podcasts is like the, the hop itself. So, and I think even Scott talks about this in his book. When I've made, I've made uh, another beer using the, a similar grist, which is going to be my next beer. I just don't have labels for it. Um, I call it Bowie in Space. I did a, a well, you were in the video. Oh, yeah. Did, yeah. <laughs> so, um, very similar beer, uh, slightly different grist, but uh, I use Galaxy and Nelson in that beer. And that beer always comes out really hazy. And I've heard that Mosaic, which is what I use in this beer that you're drinking, has a – ends up clearing a lot. Oh. Uh, and I guess it's whatever – you know, I'm not a scientist, but um, what's in Scott's book, he talks about – I think it's like M- MP44 or something along those lines. There's some sort of like precursor in certain hops that would 
lend, that could lend to hay stability. I don't know, but I know Citra has it, and I know Galaxy has it. So I'm like, all right. I mean, that would probably be a good combination. But I think another thing I'd like to try in this beer is to remove Mosaic and go 100% Citra. Oh, oh, uh, I yeah, yeah, <laughs> that'd be fun. <laughs> I've, I you know part of I was actually afraid. You know, I wasn't afraid to do this, but one of the when I when I was I started the year with this project of like trying to basically take this one recipe and design what I think is like a very modern version of a New England IPA in my home. And one of the things I thought about doing, and I, I haven't done this yet, although I think I might try, is starting with a smash beer and, tr and just through process, trying to make a hazy IPA with two ingredients. Oh. And the, the way that I think I would approach that is like, I would just do two row. I mean, you obviously have to do a base mall. But I'm worried that like not having flaked oats and not having wheat or any of these other adjuncts are going to just – the beer is just going to end up clear in the end. But if I mess with if – I, if, if, I if I can't use ingredients as a lever, then, I, then I'm forced to use other things like water chemistry and just other process-driven things to sort of find out what really makes – a hazy IPA and then add the adjuncts on top of it to just drive it home. Let, let me throw you a curveball. Yeah. I did an interview recently uh, with Mika Leitinen mm -hmm. um, of Viking Age Brews. Mm -hmm. And uh, now I my next beer, I think, is going to be a raw ale. Nice. <clears throat> Which uh, I think they I think they're they're naturally cloudy. Yeah, you know, I think yeah. They're, they're naturally hazy because you're not precipitating out those proteins. Right. At least not as much. Would that be something that you would uh, tempt? You mean not boiling? Right. You just mash. Uh, you do an, sort of an extended mash at, you know, maybe 148 or something like that. Yep. Yep. Uh, then, you know, for a couple hours and then you raise it up to, say, you know, 170, something like that. Uh, oh, that's interesting. To just to pasteurize the the wort, you know, you have the capacity to you, you recirculate, right? I mean, you're you got all the fanciness in your uh, your mash. You recirculate your mash. I yeah, I can't. I can on both. Yeah. So I mean, that's the way you know. That's the way you use the the grain bed. Listen to the episode. I just did it a couple, um, like a week or two ago. <laughs> if you well, haven't, I mean, if you so haven't you caught up. The same thing I use, which is the grain basket. And Oh, right, right. And right. I can recirculate, but I feel like as soon as you pull that basket, it's cloudy. Well, uh, but you're not wanting, to, you're not wanting a, a perfectly clear word right, for right. your purposes. Yes. Yeah, I think basically what my process is going to be is not to squeeze the bag. Uh, because okay. because at the end I, I I lift out the the bag you know in the colander and then I squeeze it and then you know of course all the stuff comes back out. Mm -hmm. uh, so I did a sati you know with a mm -hmm. really big mash, uh, and you know when I mashed in you could barely stir it at all. Uh, but but wow. at the end of an extended mash with recirculating the you know the wort through the grain it was you know it, you could actually stir the wort. Right, because uh, it loosened up. So put that in your put that in your hopper of uh, you know of, and and Mika on brewingnordic dot com. He has some articles on brewing raw ale, you know that you might find inspiring. And it, yeah, you know, maybe that maybe that could be a way that uh, you know that you could you know take huh. the, if you really want to do a cloudy or a hazy smash beer, you know that may be one yeah. thing that you want to look at. For sure. I think, I mean, obviously, like the, I've even thought about removing flaked oats entirely and just doing wheat. Because when I think about Hefeweizens, they're cloudy. And they're not made with oats. So you could do 100% or not, I don't know if you can do, well, I guess you could do 100% wheat beer. beer um, but you could do like a majority or a 50-50 split. I like the idea of 
not boil. I mean, obviously from a process perspective, not boiling sounds like a good time saver and it would probably (laughs) for this style though, being that it's like, I try to get it above 7% alcohol. Well, I guess with two row wouldn't be that I'm trying to think like, would I have, would it it max out my (laughs) system as far as grain is concerned, but probably not, especially if I remove the oats and the, and the carapils, which, you know, if I add, those are not going to contribute much to, the alcohol content because they're just adding, I guess, dextrins. But, huh, that's interesting. Yeah, I didn't even think of that, actually. That's a good idea. <laughs> so now I've made your life more difficult. <laughs> I mean, I look, no, I mean, I think that's the thing is, is I, I've never seen an experiment where someone tried to make, I know, probably because it doesn't work. I don't know. <laughs> but if you can make a hazy IPA with just two ingredients. Huh? Because I keep, when, in my head, for a long time, I used to think it's the recipe, it's the recipe, it's the recipe. And over time, I'm like, no, it's it's the process. It's it's really not about the recipe. And so I thought, what if I remove that variable completely? Knowing, like, obviously I'd pick a hop like Citra, which is, like, the go-to for that style. Plus, I know it, it does have haze uh, um, capabilities. But then controlling the mouthfeel is something I have to do with water chemistry or, in your case, not boiling. Because that would – I was, I would assume that would add to the mouthfeel. Yeah, yeah. Because you have all those proteins still in suspension. Right. So, yeah, that's not – I like that idea a lot. <laughs> I really do. I, even if I just make a Nordic New England <laughs> – a Nordic hazy. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> <clears throat> Yet another category to be added. There you go. The yeah. CP. Well, what do you? So are, you're doing that next. So I guess I'm assuming you're using a Kvike Kvike strain for that. Well, uh, Pog is coming out next from Imperial. Ah, okay. So which is the next? Uh, it's a Kvike, uh, you know, strain, and yeah. so you know it's starting to starting to warm up here. So yeah, I'm thinking. Yeah. Yeah. Just just reread, uh, you know, Mika's blog. Yep. And uh, kind of look over my process from what I did with the sati and and uh, just give it a go. So so bottom line on this mm-hmm. experiment, what is your what are your learnings from, you know, what what effects did you perceive from adding essentially just adding more hops? Yeah. Uh, you know, in, in the whirlpool. And, you know, is it a good thing? I think it is. I think it added more depth to the beer. It made it more – it made it to me feel like more like an IPA, like, you know, as, as far as like – it's I want a hoppy, hoppy beer mm-hmm. from, a, from a bitterness perspective, not a, an aroma one, although it also gives you a ton of aroma. So you get both. It also lent to more haze stability. It, it, it is a – if not slightly more hazy beer than the first one, just from four more – I mean obviously four more ounces of hops in the dry in the dry hop. I also think that the second batch, uh, because it was fermented in a pressure fermenter, I was able to do some process techniques that were a little bit better. For example, I was able to use the hop dropper on the second batch because the coils are not tight. They're, they're, they're larger. So the hops didn't get stuck in there. The other thing I can do is I can – you know, cold crash much easier because I can just add a little bit of head pressure uh, and then and then turn on my glycol chiller and it'll just chill down and I won't get any suck back. So it's it's good for that as well. And then that little bit of head pressure, I've heard I've heard this from Vinny Trelurzo that that head pressure actually pushes those hops that float on top down into the beer. Hmm. So I thought, all right, from a from a unit perspective the 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 second beer not only is it more hoppy but the actual unit that i fermented it in is more conducive to this style of beer and so uh if i if i do this beer i am definitely doing this beer again i'm probably the biggest change i'll make is going 100 percent citra and just removing re- removing mosaic mm. even though i love mosaic but i'm just curious to to scale so now that i feel like i have a very good process I would love to scale back the ingredients to see what really does make a, uh, a contribution to the the variables that I want in this beer. Yeah. Sign me up. Yeah. <laughs> You'll get, look, 
Uh, part of the reason I was canning these is because I wanted, you know, this year my goal is to brew this as many times as humanly possible. And a beer like this, sitting at seven percent in a keg, where I don't have people over every day, it it doesn't, uh, I, you know, it doesn't get drank. So I have to can <laughs> it and ship it, which is fine because you know some people I give it away locally, but not all the time. I'm glad to be on your mailing list. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, hey, well, it helps me out for sure. Well, and, and it helps us out because we're learning stuff along with you. We're learning, yeah, we learn things. So I I appreciate it greatly. Yeah, and this is this has been another fun conversation. Great, F fueled by beer and knowledge. There you go. <laughs> well, except for the. Uh, altitude pressure. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> well, I bet you. I bet you people will weigh in. They, they, I would love that. Would be the most helpful thing because I would love to just not worry about it. <laughs> but they're like, no, I'm glad you do worry about it. I'm like, oh, well, then there you go. Well, and everybody, you know, if you know, it's getting warmer up here in the northern hemisphere, yep. and and for those people who have uh, bodies of water that they get into. Uh, you know, along with brewcabin.com and the Brew Cabin YouTube channel <laughs> and all that yep. stuff, you know, beer oriented. Uh, if you if you've got a uh, swimming pool or a hot tub or I don't know what else is there, waving pools? I don't know, stock tank pools. St oh, oh God, yeah. <laughs> Post pandemic, everybody's got their still got their stock tank pools uh -huh. that they set up. Yeah. Uh, head over to swimuniversity.com and the Swim University uh, YouTube channels and uh -huh. and see what see what you see what your your day job is. My, yeah, my day job affords <laughs> the beer job. And help help Matt fuel his obsession with beer. Yeah. By, by you learning go. about uh, your swimming pools. Hey, it's all water chemistry in the end, you know. Uh, exactly. Except you know, one one you drink. Well, you could drink the other one too. <laughs> I'm well, not. I'm not recommending it. <laughs> but theoretically, but theoretically, human soup. Yeah. Mm. That's a good beer name. <laughs> With a picture of an alien on the front or something. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> All right, Matt. Uh, I appreciate uh, it. Yeah, I'm grateful as always uh, for oh, the for the you. the great beer and the fun conversation. Many thanks to Matt. I'm looking forward to hearing and hopefully tasting how this quest continues. It's, it's a delicious one, I tell you. If you have brewing questions, show suggestions, or just want to say howdy, write to james at basicbrewing.com or just fill out the contact form on basicbrewing.com. Please don't forget to tell us where you're from. Check out our mobile-friendly shop at basicbrewingshop.com. Thanks to everybody supporting us through our Patreon page. Special goodies coming your way. Check that out at patreon.com slash basicbrew. It's all until next time. Until then, thanks for listening, everybody. I'm James Spencer. Production help for Basic Brewing Radio and our website is provided by Kelly Dodson. Basic Brewing Radio is a production of Active Voicing. We'll talk to you next time, everybody. In the meantime, stay well and stay tuned. So long.